Story One, Part One of Sea Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrative of the Mutiny of the Bounty from Chambers Miscellany. About the year 1786, the merchants and planters interested in the West India Islands became anxious to introduce an exceedingly valuable plant the breadfruit tree into these possessions and as this could best be done by a government expedition a request was preferred to the crown accordingly the ministry at the time being favorable to the proposed undertaking a vessel named the bounty was selected to execute the desired object to the command of this ship captain w bly was appointed august sixteenth seventeen eighty seven the burden of the bounty was nearly two hundred and fifteen tons the establishment of men and officers for the ship was as follows one lieutenant to command one master one boatswain one gunner one carpenter one surgeon two master's mates two midshipmen two quartermasters one quartermaster's mate one boatswain's mate one gunner's mate one carpenter's mate one carpenter's crew one sailmaker, one armorer, one corporal, one clerk and steward, twenty-three able seamen, total forty-four. The addition of two men appointed to take care of the plants made the whole ship's crew amount to forty-six. The ship was stored and victualled for eighteen months. Thus prepared, the bounty set sail on the twenty-third of December, and what ensued will be best told in the language of captain bly monday twenty seventh of april seventeen eighty nine the wind being northerly in the evening we steered to the westward to pass to the south of tofua i gave directions for this course to be continued during the night the master had the first watch the gunner the middle watch and mr christian the morning watch tuesday the twenty eighth just before sunrising, while I was yet asleep, Mr. Christian, with a master at arms, gunner's mate, and Thomas Burkett, a seaman, came into my cabin, and seizing me, tied my hands with a cord behind my back, threatening me with instant death if I spoke or made the least noise. I, however, called as loud as I could in hopes of assistance, but they had already secured the officers who were not of their party by placing sentinels at their doors. There were three men at my cabin door, besides the four within. Christian had only a cutlass in his hand, the others had muskets and bayonets. I was pulled out of bed and forced on deck in my shirt, suffering great pain from the tightness with which they had tied my hands. I demanded the reason of such violence, but received no other answer than abuse for not holding my tongue. The master, the gunner, the surgeon, Mr. Elphinstone, master's mate, and Nelson were kept confined below, and the fore hatchway was guarded by sentinels. The boatswain and carpenter, and also the clerk, Mr. Samuel, were allowed to come upon deck. The boatswain was ordered to hoist the launch out with a threat, if he did not do it instantly, to take care of himself. When the boat was out, Mr. Hayward and Mr. Hallett, two of the midshipmen and Mr. Samuel, were ordered into it. I demanded what their intention was in giving this order, and endeavored to persuade the people near me not to persist in such acts of violence, but it was to no effect. Christian changed the cutlass which he had in his hand for a bayonet that was brought to him, and holding me with a strong grip by the cord that tied my hands, he, with many oaths, threatened to kill me immediately if I would not be quiet. The villains round me had their pieces cocked and bayonets fixed. Particular people were called on to go into the boat, and were hurried over the side, whence I concluded that with these people I was to be set adrift. I therefore made another effort to bring about a change, but with no other effect than to be threatened with having my brains blown out. The boatswain and seamen who were to go in the boat were allowed to collect twine, canvas, lines, sails, cordage, an eight-and-twenty-gallon cask of water, and Mr. Samuel got a hundred and fifty pounds of bread with a small quantity of rum and wine, also a quadrant, 
and compass but he was forbidden on pain of death to touch either map ephemeris book of astronomical observations sextant timekeeper or any of my surveys or drawings the officers were next called upon deck and forced over the side into the boat while i was kept apart from every one abaft the mizzenmast isaac martin one of the guard over me i saw had an inclination to assist me and as he fed me with shaddock my lips being quite parched we explained our wishes to each other by our looks but this being observed martin was removed from me he then attempted to leave the ship for which purpose he got into the boat but with many threats they obliged him to return the armorer joseph coleman and two of the carpenters mcintosh and norman were also kept contrary to their inclination and they begged of me after i was astern in the boat to remember that they declared that they had no hand in the transaction michael byrne i am told likewise wanted to leave the ship it appeared to me that christian was some time in doubt whether he should keep the carpenter or his mates at length he determined on the latter and the carpenter was ordered into the boat he was permitted but not without some opposition to take his tool chest the officers and men being in the boat they only waited for me of which the master-at-arms informed christian who then said come captain bligh your officers and men are now in the boat and you must go with them if you attempt to make the least resistance you will instantly be put to death and without further ceremony with a tribe of armed ruffians about me i was forced over the side where they untied my hands being in the boat we were veered astern by a rope a few pieces of pork were thrown to us and some clothes also four cutlasses and it was then that the armorer and carpenters called out to me to remember that they had no hand in the transaction after having undergone a great deal of ridicule and having been kept some time to make sport for these unfeeling wretches we were at length cast adrift in the open ocean i had eighteen persons with me in the boat there remained on board the bounty twenty-five hands the most able men of the ship's company having little or no wind we rowed pretty fast towards tofoa which bore northeast about ten leagues from us while the ship was in sight she steered to the west northwest but i consider this only as a feint for when we were sent away huzza for a tahiti was frequently heard among the mutineers it will very naturally be asked what could be the reason for such a revolt in answer to which i can only conjecture that the mutineers had flattered themselves with the hopes of a more happy life among the otahitians than they could possibly enjoy in england and this joined to some female connections most probably occasioned the whole transaction the women at otaheite are handsome mild and cheerful in their manners and conversation possessed of great sensibility and have sufficient delicacy to make them admired and beloved the chiefs were so much attached to our people that they rather encouraged their stay among them than otherwise and even made them promises of large possessions under these and many other attendant circumstances equally desirable it is now perhaps not so much to be wondered at though scarcely possible to have been foreseen that a set of sailors most of them void of connections should be led away especially when in addition to such powerful inducements they imagined it in their power to fix themselves in the midst of plenty on one of the finest islands in the world where they need not labor and where the allurements of dissipation are beyond anything that can be conceived fate of the castaways my first determination was to seek a supply of breadfruit and water at tofoa and afterwards to sail for Tongataboo and there risk a solicitation to Pulaho the king to equip our boat and grant us a supply of water and provisions so as to enable us to reach the East Indies. The quantity of provisions I found in the boat was a hundred and fifty pounds of bread, sixteen pieces of pork, each piece weighing two pounds, six quarts of rum, six bottles of wine with twenty eight gallons of water and four empty barracos we got to tofoa when it was dark but found the shore so steep and rocky that we could not land we were obliged therefore to remain all night in the boat keeping it on the lee side of the island with two oars next day 
Wednesday, April 29th, we found a cove where we landed. I observed the latitude of this cove to be 19 degrees 41 minutes south. This is the northwest part of Tofoa, the northwesternmost of the Friendly Islands. As I was resolved to spare the small stock of provisions we had in the boat, we endeavored to procure something towards our support on the island itself. For two days we ranged through the island in parties, seeking for water and anything in the shape of provisions, subsisting meanwhile on morsels of what we had brought with us. The island at first seemed uninhabited, but on Friday, May 1st, one of our exploring parties met Cove and brought two coconut shells of water. I endeavored to make friends of these people and send them away for breadfruit, plantains, and water. Soon after, other natives came to us, and by noon there were thirty about us, from whom we obtained a small supply. I was much puzzled in what manner to account to the natives for the loss of my ship. I knew they had too much sense to be amused with the story that the ship was to join me when she was not in sight from the hills. I was at first doubtful whether I should tell the real fact, or say that the ship had overset and sunk, and that we only were saved. The latter appeared to be the most proper and advantageous for us, and I accordingly instructed my people that we might all agree in one story. As I expected, inquiries were made about the ship, and they seemed readily satisfied with our account. But there did not appear the least symptom of joy or sorrow in their faces, although I fancied I discovered some marks of surprise. Some of the natives were coming and going the whole afternoon. Towards evening, I had the satisfaction to find our stock of provisions somewhat increased. But the natives did not appear to have much to spare. What they brought was in such small quantities that I had no reason to hope we should be able to procure from them sufficient to stock us for our voyage. At night, I served a quarter of a breadfruit and a cocoa nut to each person for supper, and a good fire being made, all but the watch went to sleep. Saturday the second. As there was no certainty of our being supplied with water by the natives, I sent a party among the gullies in the mountains with empty shells to see what could be found. In their absence the natives came about us, as I expected, and in greater numbers. Two canoes also came in from round the north side of the island. In one of them was an elderly chief called Maka Akaval. Soon after, some of our foraging party returned, and with them came a good-looking chief called Igijifo or Ifo. Their affability was of short duration, for the natives began to increase in number, and I observed some symptoms of a design against us. Soon after, they attempted to haul the boat on shore, on which I brandished my cutlass in a threatening manner, and spoke to Ifo to desire them to desist, which they did and everything became quiet again. My people, who had been in the mountains, now returned with about three gallons of water, and I kept buying up the little breadfruit that was brought to us, and likewise some spears to arm my men with, having only four cutlasses, two of which were in the boat. As we had no means of improving our situation, I told our people I would wait until sunset, by which time, perhaps, something might happen in our favor for if we attempted to go at present we might fight our way through which we could do more advantageously at night and that in the meantime we would endeavor to get off to the boat what we had bought the beach was lined with the natives and we heard nothing but the knocking of stones together which they had in each hand i knew very well this was the sign of an attack at noon i served a coconut and a breadfruit to each person for dinner and gave some to the chiefs with whom I continued to appear intimate and friendly. They frequently importuned me to sit down, but I as constantly refused, for it occurred both to Nelson and myself that they intended to seize hold of me if I gave them such an opportunity. Keeping therefore constantly in our guard, we were suffered to eat our uncomfortable meal in some quietness. After dinner, we began by little and little to get our things into the boat, which was a troublesome business on account of the surf. I carefully watched the motions of the natives, who continued to increase in number, and found that instead of their intention being to leave us, fires were made, and places fixed on for their stay during the night. Consultations were also held among them, and everything assured me we should be attacked. 
I sent orders to the master that when he saw us coming down he should keep the boat close to the shore that we might the more readily embark the sun was near setting when I gave the word on which every person who was on shore with me boldly took up his proportion of things and carried them to the boat the chiefs asked me if I would not stay with them all night I said no I never sleep out of my boat but in the morning we will again trade with you and I shall remain till the weather is moderate that we may go as we have agreed to see Pulaho at Tungataboo Maka Akavau then got up and said you will not sleep on shore then matey which directly signifies we will kill you and he left me the onset was now preparing everyone as I have described before kept knocking stones together and Efo quitted me all but two or three things were in the boat when we walked down the beach every one in a silent kind of horror we all got into the boat except one man who while I was getting on board quitted it and ran up to the beach to cast the stern fast off notwithstanding the master and others called him to return while they were hauling me out of the water I was no sooner in the boat than the attack began by about two hundred men the unfortunate poor man who had run up the beach was knocked down and the stones flew like a shower of shot many Indians got hold of the stern rope and were near hauling the boat on shore which they would certainly have effected if I had not had a knife in my pocket with which I cut the rope we then hauled off to the grapnel everyone being more or less hurt at this time I saw five of the natives about the poor man they had killed and two of them were beating him about the head with stones in their hands we had no time to reflect for to my surprise they filled their canoes with stones and twelve men came after us to renew the attack which they did so effectually as to nearly disable us all we were obliged to sustain the attack without being able to return it except with such stones as lodged in the boat I adopted the expedient of throwing overboard some clothes which as I expected they stopped to pick up and as it was by this time almost dark they gave over the attack and returned towards shore leaving us to reflect on our unhappy situation the poor man killed by the natives was John Norton this was his second voyage with me as a quartermaster and his worthy character made me lament his loss very much he has left an aged parent I am told whom he supported we set our sails and steered along shore by the west side of the island of Tofoa the wind blowing fresh from the eastward my mind was employed in considering what was best to be done when I was solicited by all hands to take them towards home and when I told them that no hopes of relief for us remained except what might be found at New Holland till I came to Timor a distance of full twelve hundred leagues where there was a Dutch settlement but in what part of the island I knew not they all agreed to live on one ounce of bread and a quarter of a pint of water per day therefore after examining our stock of provisions and recommending to them in the most solemn manner not to depart from their promise we bore away across a sea where the navigation is but little known in a small boat twenty-three feet long from stem to stern deep laden with eighteen men i was happy however to see that every one seemed better satisfied with our situation than myself our stock of provisions consisted of about one hundred and fifty pounds of bread twenty-eight gallons of water twenty pounds of pork three bottles of wine and five quarts of rum the difference between this and the quantity we had on leaving the ship was principally owing to our loss in the bustle and confusion of the attack a few coconuts were in the boat and some breadfruit but the latter was trampled to pieces sunday the third at daybreak the gale increased the sun rose very fiery and red a sure indication of a severe gale of wind at eight it blew a violent storm and the sea ran very high so that between the seas the sail was becalmed and when on the top of the sea it was too much to have set but we could not venture to take in the sail for we were in very imminent danger and distress the sea curling over the stern of the boat which obliged us to bail with all our might a situation more distressing has perhaps seldom been experienced our bread was in bags and in danger of being spoiled by the wet to be starved to death was inevitable if this could not be prevented i therefore began to examine what clothes there were in the boat 
and what other things could be spared and having determined that only two suits should be kept for each person the rest was thrown overboard with some rope and spare sails which lightened the boat considerably and we had more room to bail the water out fortunately the carpenter had good chests in the boat in which we secured the bread the most favorable moment his tool chest also was cleared and the tools stowed in the bottom of the boat so that this became a second convenience i served a teaspoon of rum to each person for we were very wet and cold with a quarter of a breadfruit which was scarce eatable for dinner our engagement was now strictly to be carried into execution and i was fully determined to make our provisions last eight weeks let the daily proportion be ever so small monday the fourth at daylight our limbs were so benumbed that we could scarcely find the use of them at this time i served a teaspoon of rum to each person from which we all found great benefit just before noon we discovered a small flat island of a moderate height bearing west southwest four or five leagues i observed our latitude to be eighteen degrees fifty eight minutes south our longitude was by account three degrees four minutes west from the island of tofoa having made a north seventy two degrees west course distance of ninety five miles since yesterday noon i divided five small coconuts for our dinner and every one was satisfied during the rest of that day we discovered ten or twelve other islands none of which we approached at night i served a few broken pieces of breadfruit for supper and performed prayers tuesday the fifth the night having been fair we awoke after a tolerable rest and contentedly breakfasted on a few pieces of yams that were found in the boat after breakfast we examined our bread a great deal of which was damaged and rotten this nevertheless we were glad to keep for use we passed two islands in the course of the day for dinner i served some of the damaged bread and a quarter of a pint of water wednesday the sixth we still kept our course in the direction of the north of new holland passing numerous islands of various sizes at none of which i ventured to land our allowance for the day was a quarter of a pint of coconut milk and the meat which did not exceed two ounces to each person it was received very contentedly but we suffered great drought to our great joy we hooked a fish but we were miserably disappointed by its being lost in trying to get it into the boat as our lodgings were very miserable and confined for want of room i endeavored to remedy the latter defect by putting ourselves at watch and watch so that one half always sat up while the other lay down on the boat's bottom or upon a chest with nothing to cover us but the heavens our limbs were dreadfully cramped for we could not stretch them out and the nights were so cold and we so constantly wet that after a few hours sleep we could scarcely move thursday the seventh being very wet and cold i served a spoonful of rum and a morsel of bread for breakfast we still kept sailing among the islands from one of which two large canoes put out in chase of us but we left them behind whether these canoes had any hostile intention against us must remain a doubt perhaps we might have benefited by an intercourse with them but in our defenseless situation to have made the experiment would have been risking too much i imagine these to be the islands called fiji as their extent direction and distance from the friendly islands answer to the description given of them by those islanders heavy rain came on at four o'clock when every person did their utmost to catch some water and we increased our stock to thirty-four gallons besides quenching our thirst for the first time since we had been at sea but an attendant consequence made us pass the night very miserably for being extremely wet and having no dry things to shift or cover us we experienced cold shiverings scarcely to be conceived most fortunately for us the forenoon friday the eighth turned out fair and we stripped and dried our clothes the allowance I issued today was an ounce and a half of pork, a teaspoon of rum, half a pint of coconut milk, and an ounce of bread. The rum, though so small in quantity, was of the greatest service. A fishing line was generally towing from the stern of the boat, but though we saw great numbers of fish, we could never catch one. In the afternoon we cleaned out the boat, and it employed us till sunset to get everything dry and in order hitherto i had issued the allowance by guess but i now made a pair of scales with two coconut shells 
and having accidentally some pistol balls in the boat, twenty-five of which weighed one pound or sixteen ounces, I adopted one as the proportion of weight that each person should receive of bread at the times I served it. I also amused all hands with describing the situation of New Guinea and New Holland, and gave them every information in my power that in case any accident happened to me, those who survived might have some idea of what they were about, and be able to find their way to Timor, which at present they knew nothing of more than the name, and some not even that. At night I served a quarter of a pint of water and half an ounce of bread for supper. Saturday the ninth. About nine in the evening the clouds began to gather, and we had a prodigious fall of rain with severe thunder and lightning. By midnight we caught about twenty gallons of water. Being miserably wet and cold, I served to the people a teaspoon of rum each to enable them to bear with their distressed situation. The weather continued extremely bad, and the wind increased. We spent a very miserable night without sleep, except such as could be got in the midst of rain. The day brought no relief but its light. The sea broke over us so much that two men were constantly bailing, and we had no choice how to steer, being obliged to keep before the waves for fear of the boat filling. The allowance now regularly served to each person was one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread and a quarter of a pint of water at eight in the morning, at noon, and at sunset. Today I gave about half an ounce of pork for dinner, which though any moderate person would have considered only as a mouthful, was divided into three or four. All Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the wet weather continued with heavy seas and squalls. As there was no prospect of getting our clothes dried, my plan was to make every one strip and wring them through the salt water, by which means they received a warmth that while wet with rain they could not have. We were constantly shipping seas and bailing, and were very wet and cold during the night. The sight of the islands, which we were always passing, served only to increase the misery of our situation. We were very little better than starving, with plenty in view, and yet to attempt procuring any relief was attended with so much danger, that prolonging of life, even in the midst of misery, was thought preferable, while there remained hopes of being able to surmount our hardships. For my own part, I consider the general run of cloudy and wet weather to be a blessing of providence. Hot weather would have caused us to have died with thirst, and probably, being so constantly covered with rain or sea, protected us from that dreadful calamity. Saturday the 16th. The sun, breaking out through the clouds, gave us hopes of drying our wet clothes, but the sunshine was of short duration. We had strong breezes at southeast by south, and dark gloomy weather with storms of thunder lightning and rain the night was truly horrible and not a star to be seen so that our steerage was uncertain sunday the seventeenth at dawn of day i found every person complaining and some of them solicited extra allowance which i positively refused our situation was miserable always wet and suffering extreme cold during the night without the least shelter from the weather. Being constantly obliged to bail to keep the boat from filling was perhaps not to be reckoned an evil, as it gave us exercise. The little rum we had was of great service. When our nights were particularly distressing, I generally served a teaspoonful or two to each person, and it was always joyful tidings when they heard of my intentions. The night was dark and dismal, the sea constantly breaking over us, and nothing but the wind and waves to direct our steerage. It was my intention, if possible, to make to New Holland, to the southward of Endeavour Straits, being sensible that it was necessary to preserve such a situation as would make a southerly wind a fair one, that we might range along the reefs till an opening should be found into smooth water, and we the sooner be able to pick up some refreshments. Monday and Tuesday were terrible days, heavy rain with lightning, we were always bailing. On Wednesday the 20th, at dawn of day, some of my people seemed half dead. Our appearance was horrible, and I could look no way but I caught the eye of someone in distress. Extreme hunger was now too evident, but no one suffered from thirst, nor had we much inclination to drink, that desire perhaps being satisfied through the skin. The little sleep we got 
was in the midst of water and we constantly awoke with severe cramps and pains in our bones thursday friday and saturday we were in the same distressed condition and i began to fear that such another night or two would put an end to us on saturday however the wind moderated in the evening and the weather looked so much better which rejoiced all hands so that they ate their scanty allowance with more satisfaction than for some time past the night also was fair but being always wet with the sea we suffered much from the cold sunday the twenty fourth a fine morning i had the pleasure to see produce some cheerful countenances and for the first time for fifteen days past we experienced comfort from the warmth of the sun we stripped and hung our clothes up to dry which were by this time become so threadbare that they would not keep out either wet or cold this afternoon we had many birds about us which are never seen far from land such as boobies and noddies as the sea began to run fair and we shipped but little water i took the opportunity to examine into the state of our bread and found that according to the present mode of issuing there was a sufficient quantity remaining for twenty-nine days allowance by which time i hoped we should be able to reach timor but as this was very uncertain and it was possible that after all we might be obliged to go to java i determined to proportion the allowance so as to make our stock hold out six weeks i was apprehensive that this would be ill received and that it would require my utmost resolution to enforce it for small as the quantity was which i intended to take away for our future good yet it might appear to my people like robbing them of life and some who were less patient than their companions i expected would very ill brook it however on my representing the necessity of guarding against delays that might be occasioned in our voyage by contrary winds or other causes and promising to enlarge upon the allowance as we got on they cheerfully agreed to my proposal it was accordingly settled that every person should receive one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread for breakfast and the same quantity for dinner so that by omitting the proportion for supper we had forty-three days allowance monday the twenty-fifth at noon some noddies came so near to us that one of them was caught by hand this bird was about the size of a small pigeon i divided it with its entrails into eighteen portions and by a well-known method at sea of who shall have this it was distributed with the allowance of bread and water for dinner and ate up bones and all with salt water for sauce i observed the latitude thirteen degrees thirty two minutes south longitude made thirty five degrees nineteen minutes west course north eighty nine degrees west distance one hundred and eight miles in the evening several boobies flying very near to us we had the good fortune to catch one of them this bird is as large as a duck i directed the bird to be killed for supper and the blood to be given to three of the people who were most distressed for want of food the body with the entrails beak and feet i divided into eighteen shares and with an allowance of bread which i made a merit of granting we made a good supper compared with our usual fare sailing on tuesday wednesday and thursday i at length became satisfied that we were approaching new holland this was actually the case and after passing the reefs which bound that part of the coast we found ourselves in smooth water two islands lay about four miles to the west by north and appeared eligible for a resting place if for nothing more but on our approach to the nearest island it proved to be only a heap of stones and its size too inconsiderable to shelter the boat we therefore proceeded to the next which was close to it and toward the main we landed to examine if there were any signs of the natives being near us we saw some old fireplaces but nothing to make me apprehend that this would be an unsafe situation for the night everyone was anxious to find something to eat and it was soon discovered that there were oysters on these rocks for the tide was out but it was nearly dark and only a few could be gathered i determined therefore to wait till the morning when i should know better how to proceed friday the twenty ninth as there were no appearances to make me imagine that any of the natives were near us i sent out parties in search of supplies while others of the people were putting the boat in order 
the parties returned highly rejoiced at having found plenty of oysters and fresh water i had also made a fire by the help of a small magnifying glass and what was still more fortunate we found among a few things which had been thrown into the boat and saved a piece of brimstone and a tinder box so that i secured fire for the future one of the people had been so provident as to bring away with him from the ship a copper pot by being in possession of this article we were enabled to make a proper use of the supply we now obtained for with a mixture of bread and a little pork we made a stew that might have been relished by people of far more delicate appetites and of which each person received a full pint the general complaints of disease among us were a dizziness in the head great weakness of the joints and violent tenesmus the oysters which we found grew so fast to the rocks that it was with difficulty they could be broken off and at length we discovered to be the most expeditious way to open them where they were fixed they were of a good size and well tasted to add to this happy circumstance in the hollow of the land there grew some wire grass which indicated a moist situation on forcing a stick about three feet long into the ground we found water and with little trouble dug a well which produced as much as our necessities required as the day was the anniversary of the restoration of king charles the second i named the island restoration island our short stay there with the supplies which it afforded us made a visible alteration for the better in our appearance next day saturday the thirtieth at four o'clock we were preparing to embark when about twenty of the natives appeared running and hallooing to us on the opposite shore they were each armed with a spear or lance and a short weapon which they carried in their left hand they made signs for us to come to them but i thought it prudent to make the best of our way they were naked and apparently black and their hair all wool bushy and short sunday the thirty first many small islands were in sight to the northeast we landed at one of good height bearing north one half west the shore was rocky but the water was smooth and we landed without difficulty i sent two parties out one to the northward and the other to the southward to seek for supplies and others i ordered to stay by the boat on this occasion fatigue and weakness so far got the better of their sense of duty that some of the people expressed their discontent at having worked harder than their companions and declared that they would rather be without their dinner than go in search of it one person in particular went so far as to tell me with a mutinous look that he was as good a man as myself it was not possible for me to judge where this might have an end if not stopped in time therefore to prevent such disputes in the future i determined either to preserve my command or die in the attempt and seizing a cutlass i ordered him to take hold of another and defend himself on which he called out that i was going to kill him and immediately made concessions i did not allow this to interfere further with the harmony of the boat's crew and everything soon became quiet we here procured some oysters and clams also some dogfish caught in the holes of the rocks and a supply of water leaving this island which i named sunday island we continued our course towards Endeavour Straits. During our voyage, Nelson became very ill, but gradually recovered. Next day we landed at another island to see what we could get. There were proofs that this island was occasionally visited by natives from New Holland. Encamping on the shore, I sent out one party to watch for turtle, and another to try to catch birds. About midnight, the bird party returned with only twelve noddies, birds which i have already described to be about the size of pigeons but if it had not been for the folly and obstinacy of one of the party who separated from the other two and disturbed the birds they might have caught a great number i was so much provoked at my plans being thus defeated that i gave this offender a good beating this man afterwards confessed that wandering away from his companions he had eaten nine birds raw our turtling party had no success tuesday and wednesday we still kept our course northwest touching at an island or two for oysters and clams we had now been six days on the coast of new holland and but for the refreshment which our visit to its shores afforded us it is all but certain that we must have perished 
now however it became clear that we were leaving it behind and were commencing our adventurous journey through the open sea to timor on wednesday june third at eight o'clock in the evening we once more launched into the open ocean miserable as our situation was in every respect i was secretly surprised to see that it did not appear to affect anyone so strongly as myself i encouraged everyone with hopes that eight or ten days would bring us to a land of safety and after praying to god for a continuance of his most gracious protection i served an allowance of water for supper and directed our course to the west southwest to counteract the southerly winds in case they should blow strong for six days our voyage continued a dreary repetition of those sufferings which we had experienced before reaching new holland in the course of the night we were constantly wet with the sea and exposed to cold and shiverings and in the daytime we had no addition to our scanty allowance save a booby and a small dolphin that we caught the former on friday the fifth and the latter on monday the eighth many of us were ill and the men complained heavily on wednesday the tenth after a very comfortless night there was a visible alteration for the worse in many of the people which gave me great apprehensions an extreme weakness swelled legs hollow and ghastly countenances a more than common inclination to sleep with an apparent debility of understanding seemed to me the melancholy presages of an approaching dissolution thursday the eleventh every one received the customary allowance of bread and water and an extra allowance of water was given to those who were most in need at noon i observed in latitude nine degrees forty one minutes south course south seventy seven degrees west distance one hundred nine miles longitude made thirteen degrees forty nine minutes west i had little doubt now of having now passed the meridian of the eastern part of timor which is laid down at one hundred and twenty eight degrees east this diffused universal joy and satisfaction friday the twelfth at three in the morning with an excess of joy we discovered timor bearing from west southwest to west northwest and i hauled on a wind to the north northeast till daylight when the land bore from southwest by south to northeast by north our distance from the shore two leagues it is not possible for me to describe the pleasure which the blessing of the sight of this land diffused among us it appeared scarcely credible to ourselves that in an open boat and so poorly provided we should have been able to reach the coast of timor in forty-one days after leaving tofoa having in that time run by our log a distance of three thousand six hundred and eighteen miles and that notwithstanding our extreme distress no one should have perished in the voyage i have already mentioned that i knew not where the dutch settlement was situated but i had a faint idea that it was at the southwest part of the island i therefore after daylight bore away along shore to the south southwest which i was the more readily induced to do as the wind would not suffer us to go towards the northeast without great loss of time we coasted along the island in the direction in which i conceived the dutch settlement to lie and next day about two o'clock i came to a grapnel in a small sandy bay where we saw a hut a dog and some cattle here i learned that the dutch governor resided at a place called kupang which was some distance to the northeast i made signs for one of the indians who came to the beach to go in the boat and show us the way to kupang intimating that i would pay him for his trouble the man readily complied and came into the boat the indians who were of a dark tawny color brought us a few pieces of dried turtle and some ears of indian corn this last was the most welcome for the turtle was so hard that it could not be eaten without being first soaked in hot water they offered to bring us some other refreshments if i would wait but as the pilot was willing i determined to push on it was about half past four when we sailed sunday the fourteenth at one o'clock in the morning after the most happy and sweet sleep that ever men enjoyed we weighed and continued to keep the east shore on board in very smooth water the report of two cannon that were fired gave new life to everyone 
and soon after we discovered two square-rigged vessels and a cutter at anchor to the eastward after hard rowing we came to a grapnel near daylight off a small fort and town which the pilot told me was kupang on landing i was surrounded by many people indians and dutch with an english sailor among them a dutch captain named spikerman showed me great kindness and waited on the governor who was ill to know at what time i could see him eleven o'clock having been appointed for the interview i desired my people to come on shore which was as much as some of them could do being scarce able to walk they however were helped to captain spikerman's house and found tea with bread and butter provided for their breakfast the abilities of a painter perhaps could seldom have been displayed to more advantage than in the delineation of the two groups of figures which at this time presented themselves to each other an indifferent spectator would have been at a loss which most to admire the eyes of famine sparkling at immediate relief or the horror of their preservers at the sight of so many spectres whose ghastly countenances if the cause had been unknown would rather have excited terror than pity our bodies were nothing but skin and bone our limbs were full of sores and we were clothed in rags in this condition with tears of joy and gratitude flowing down our cheeks the people of timor beheld us with a mixture of horror surprise and pity the governor mr william adrian van est notwithstanding extreme ill health became so anxious about us that i saw him before the appointed time he received me with great affection and gave me the fullest proofs that he was possessed of every feeling of a humane and good man though his infirmity was so great that he could not do the office of a friend himself he said he would give such orders as i might be certain would procure us every supply we wanted a house should be immediately prepared for me and with respect to my people he said that i might have room for them either at the hospital or on board of captain spikerman's ship which lay in the road fate of the mutineers colony of pitcairn's island the intelligence of the mutiny and the sufferings of bligh and his companions naturally excited a great sensation in england bligh was immediately promoted to the rank of commander and captain edwards was dispatched to otaheite in the pandora frigate with instructions to search for the bounty and her mutinous crew and bring them to england the pandora reached matavai bay on the twenty third of march seventeen ninety one and even before she had come to anchor joseph coleman formerly armorer of the bounty pushed off from shore in a canoe and came on board in the course of two days afterwards the whole of the remainder of the bounty's crew in number sixteen then on the island surrendered themselves with the exception of two who fled to the mountains where as afterwards appeared they were murdered by the natives nearly twenty years elapsed after the period of the above occurrences and all recollection of the bounty and her wrecked crew had passed away when an accidental discovery as interesting as unexpected once more recalled public attention to that event the captain of an american schooner having in eighteen o eight accidentally touched at an island up to that time supposed to be uninhabited called pitcairn's island found a community speaking english who represented themselves as the descendants of the mutineers of the bounty of whom there was still one man of the name of alexander smith alive amongst them intelligence of this singular circumstance was sent by the american captain folger to sir sidney smith at valparaiso and by him transmitted to the lords of the admiralty but the government was at that time perhaps too much engaged in the events of the continental war to attend to the information nor was anything further heard of this interesting little society until eighteen fourteen in that year two british men-of-war cruising in the pacific made pitcairn's island and on nearing the shore saw plantations regularly and orderly laid out soon afterwards they observed a few natives coming down a steep descent with their canoes on their shoulders and in a few minutes perceived one of these little vessels darting through a heavy surf and paddling off towards the ships but their astonishment may be imagined when on coming alongside they were hailed in good english with won't you heave us a rope now 
This being done, a young man sprang up the side with extraordinary activity and stood on the deck before them. In answer to the question, Who are you? He replied that his name was Thursday October Christian, son of the late Fletcher Christian by an Otahitian mother, that he was the first born on the island and was so named because he was born on a Thursday in October. All this sounded singular and incredible in the ears of the British captains, Sir Thomas Staines and Mr. Pippin, but they were soon satisfied of its truth. Young Christian was at this time about twenty-four years old, a tall, handsome youth, fully six feet high, with black hair, and an open, interesting English countenance. As he wore no clothes except a piece of cloth round his loins and a straw hat ornamented with black cock's feathers, his fine figure and well-shaped muscular limbs were displayed to great advantage, and attracted general admiration. His body was much tanned by exposure to the weather. But although his complexion was somewhat brown, it wanted that tinge of red peculiar to the natives of the Pacific. He spoke English correctly, both in grammar and pronunciation, and his frank and ingenious deportment excited in every one the liveliest feelings of compassion and interest. His companion was a fine, handsome youth of seventeen or eighteen years of age, named George Young, son of one of the bounty's midshipmen. The youths expressed great surprise at everything they saw, especially a cow, which they supposed to be either a huge goat or a horned sow, having never seen any other quadrupeds. When questioned concerning the bounty, they referred the captains to an old man on shore, the only surviving Englishman whose name they said was John Adams, but who proved to be the identical Alexander Smith, before mentioned, having changed his name from some caprice or other. The officers went ashore with the youths, and were received by old Adams, as we shall now call him, who conducted them to his house, and treated them to an elegant repast of eggs, fowl, yams, plantains, breadfruit, etc. They now learned from him an account of the fate of his companions, who, with himself, preferred accompanying Christian in the bounty to remaining at Otaheite which account agreed with that he afterwards gave at greater length to Captain Beechey in 1828. Our limits will not permit us to detail all the interesting particulars at length as we could have wished, but they are in substance as follows. It was Christian's object, in order to avoid the vengeance of the British law, to proceed to some unknown and uninhabited island, and the Marquises Islands were first fixed upon. But Christian, on reading Captain Cataret's account of Pitcairn's Island, thought it better adapted for the purpose, and shaped his course thither. Having landed and traversed it, they found it every way suitable to their wishes, possessing water, wood, a good soil, and some fruits. Having ascertained all this, they returned on board, and having landed their hogs, goats, and poultry, and gutted the ship of everything that could be useful to them, they set fire to her, and destroyed every vestige that might lead to the discovery of their retreat. This was on the 23rd of January, 1790. The island was then divided into nine equal portions among them, a suitable spot of neutral ground being reserved for a village. The poor Otahitians now found themselves reduced to the condition of mere slaves, but they patiently submitted, and everything went on peaceably for two years. About that time, Williams, one of the seamen, having the misfortune to lose his wife, forcibly took the wife of one of the Otahitians, which, together with their continued ill usage, so exasperated the latter that they formed a plan for murdering the whole of their oppressors. The plot, however, was discovered and revealed by the Englishmen's wives, and two of the Otahitians were put to death. But the surviving natives soon afterwards matured a more successful conspiracy, and in one day murdered five of the Englishmen, including Christian. Adams and Young were spared at the intercession of their wives, and the remaining two, McCoy and Quintal, two desperate ruffians, escaped to the mountains, whence, however, they soon rejoined their companions. But the further career of these two villains was short. McCoy, having been bred up in a Scottish distillery, succeeded in extracting a bottle of ardent spirits from the tea root, from which time he and Quintal were never sober, until the former became delirious and committed suicide by jumping over a cliff. 
Quintal, being likewise almost insane with drinking, made repeated attempts to murder Adams and Young, until they were absolutely compelled, for their own safety, to put him to death, which they did by felling him with a hatchet. Adams and Young were at length the only surviving males who had landed on the island, and being both of a serious turn of mind, and having time for reflection and repentance, they became extremely devout. Having saved a Bible and prayer book from the bounty, they now performed family worship morning and evening, and addressed themselves to training up their own children and those of their unfortunate companions in piety and virtue. Young, however, was soon carried off by an asthmatic complaint, and Adams was thus left to continue his pious labors alone. At the time Captains Staines and Pippin visited the island, this interesting little colony consisted of about forty-six persons, mostly grown-up young people, all living in harmony and happiness together, and not only professing, but fully understanding and practicing the precepts and principles of the Christian religion. Adams had instituted the ceremony of marriage, and he assured his visitors that not one instance of debauchery and immoral conduct had occurred amongst them. The visitors, having supplied these interesting people with some tools, kettles, and other articles, took their leave. The account which they transmitted home of this newly discovered colony was, strange to say, as little attended to by government as that of Captain Folger, and nothing more was heard of Adams and his family for nearly twelve years, when in 1825 Captain Beechey, in the Blossom, bound on a voyage of discovery to Bering Strait, touched at Pitcairn's Island. On the approach of the Blossom, a boat came off under all sail towards the ship, containing old Adams and ten of the young men of the island. After requesting and obtaining leave to come on board, the young men sprang up the side and shook every officer cordially by the hand. Adams, who was grown very corpulent, followed more leisurely. He was dressed in a sailor suit and trousers, with a low-crowned hat, which he held in his hand in sailor fashion while he smoothed down his bald forehead when addressed by the officers of the Blossom. The little colony had now increased to about sixty-six, including an English sailor of the name of John Buffett, who, at his own earnest desire, had been left by a whaler. In this man the society luckily found an able and willing schoolmaster. He instructed the children in reading, writing, and arithmetic, and devoutly cooperated with old Adams in affording religious instruction to the community. The officers of the Blossom went ashore, and were entertained with a sumptuous repast at young Christians, the table being spread with plates, knives, and forks. Buffett said grace in an emphatic manner, and so strict were they in this respect, that it was not deemed proper to touch a morsel of bread without saying grace, both before and after it. The officers slept in the house all night, their bedclothing and sheets consisting of the native cloth made of the native mulberry tree. The only interruption to their repose was the melody of the evening hymn which was chanted together by the whole family after the lights were put out, and they were awakened at early dawn by the same devotional ceremony. On Sabbath the utmost decorum was attended to, and the day was passed in regular religious observances. In consequence of a representation made by Captain Beechey, the British government sent out Captain Waldegrave in 1830 in the Seringapatam with a supply of sailors' blue jackets and trousers, flannels, stockings, and shoes, women's dresses, spades, mattocks, shovels, pickaxes, trowels, rakes, etc. He found their community increased to about seventy-nine, all exhibiting the same unsophisticated and amiable characteristics as we have before described. Two other Englishmen had settled amongst them, one of them called Nobbs, a low-bred illiterate man, a self-constituted missionary who was endeavoring to supersede Buffett in his office of religious instructor. The patriarch, Adams, it was found, had died in March of 1829, aged Sixty-five. While on his deathbed he had called the heads of families together, and urged upon them to elect a chief, which, however, they had not yet done, but the greatest harmony still prevailed amongst them, notwithstanding Nobbs' exertions to form a party of his own. 
Captain Waldegrave thought that the island, which is about four miles square, might be able to support a thousand persons, upon reaching which number they would naturally emigrate to other islands. Such is the account of this most singular colony, originating in crime and bloodshed. Of all the repentant criminals on record, the most interesting, perhaps, is John Adams, nor do we know where to find a more beautiful example of the value of early instruction than in the history of this man, who, having run the full career of nearly all kinds of vice, was checked by an interval of leisurely reflection and the sense of new duties awakened by the power of natural affections.